Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to the new school, to this event, in collaboration with uh, MOFAD. Uh, this is a little low, so I'll get more relaxed. Um, so I wanted to welcome, on behalf of the new school, the Food Studies Program. I'm Fabio Parasecoli, the Director of Food Studies Initiatives. And here we have B. Banyu, who's the uh, Chair of the Undergraduate Food Studies. Um, we're very happy to have this event here. Uh, but before we start, we just wanted to say a few things on, on what we do here at the new school. Uh, we have a growing program, which is now a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, we've just launched an associate degree. Uh, it started this, um, this fall, actually. And uh, we offer classes in history, culture, policy, health, environment, everything that um, is relevant for food. Um, most of our classes, and this is very important for us, are open to the general public. It's a tradition in the new school, and we're very happy to continue the tradition. So people who want to get more information about specific topics can take our classes. Um, an important part of our programs, of course, uh, is uh, a series of events that we have over the year. This fall, we have this one. And then uh, on November 6th and 7th, we're going to host the second International Food Design Conference. And we have participants literally from all over the world. I'm managing the invitation letters to, for visa and whatnot. It's interesting. Uh, but I invite you to, to look into it. It's a unique opportunity. Uh, food design is still not very discussed here in the US. Well, it's pretty big elsewhere in the world. And we're very happy to be at the forefront of that. Um, last but not least, we have a website called The Inquisitive Eater. It's inquisitiveeater.com, where we welcome submissions uh, from anybody. Uh, and it could, could be fiction, nonfiction, poetry, photographs, design, any form of expression that has to do with food. So please uh, look at the website and consider maybe um, submitting some of your material. Maybe somebody of you already is a writer or a photographer or a painter. Um, I think I'm not forgetting anything. Uh, welcome again, and I will introduce Peter Kim. Peter. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much, Fabio. Uh, thank you to the New School. Thank you, uh, Heritage Radio Network, and all of the incredible partners who are helping us with this event this evening. Uh, my name is Peter Kim. I am the Executive Director of the Museum of Food and Drink, or MOFAD. MOFAD is a nonprofit that is launching New York's first food museum with exhibits you can eat. And uh, at this museum, we want to take people on a tasting, smelling, and learning adventure through the world of food. We also want MOFAD to serve as a forum for the exchange of ideas. And that is the spirit that underlies this event series, MOFAD Roundtable, which brings together some of the world's leading experts to debate controversial issues in food. We have waded into some thorny issues already, such as GMOs and the future of meat, and this evening, of course, technology and the new food ethic. Um, I do want to say one more thing before we kick things off. I have an exciting announcement for everybody. Uh, MOFAD is opening up its first brick and mortar space in actually just under a month, <laughs> which is exciting, also terrifying uh, in certain ways. Um, but we are. Um, this is a really exciting development for us. We've been working for years on this, and we have a beautiful 5,000 square foot uh, converted warehouse in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And on October 28, we are debuting our first exhibition there, Flavor, Making It and Faking It, which is going to be a multi-sensory exhibition that explores the little known story of the $25 billion flavor industry that pretty much has transformed what we eat. And so I, I'm really excited about this exhibition. We'll have tastings and smellings throughout the exhibition, of course, in true MOFAD spirit. And the space is quite limited for it, so I would recommend, if you want to go, to go to tickets.mofad.org to get your tickets in advance. OK, so let's get to it. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Emma Bost, MOFAD's program director and the mastermind behind MOFAD Roundtable. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. 
Uh, so, so pleased that you guys are all here tonight. It's lovely to see such a packed house. Um, I think you guys are all aware that the theme of tonight's discussion is food technology. Um, and we're going to be including under that umbrella both agricultural technology and also <laughs> food processing technology, things like cooking. Um, in the last century or so, the industrialized food system has really revolutionized the way that we eat. Um, food safety, the amount of work we put into cooking on a given day, uh, these are all things that have been changed radically by this new form of food production and distribution. It's also helped women break into the workforce and has given us arguably more varied diets and certainly a more consistent supply of food. On the other hand, these food innovations have also had some negative consequences um, in the form of overproduction, waste, um, cheap food with arguably subpar nutrition. And some have also argued that uh, food innovation and food technology uh, has given us a more consistent and plentiful food supply um, in exchange for, uh, or perhaps at the expense of, uh, a more diverse and rich sensory experience. So these are all arguments that uh, our great panel is going to delve into this evening. Uh, I'd like to just quickly introduce them. Uh, their bios are in the programs that you guys have, so if you'd like more information about their work, you can look there. Uh, we have Stephanie Barden here, who is a artist. She's a former art artist in residence at uh, NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program. She's also a uh, part-time lecturer here at the New School, uh, as well as at NYU. Uh, Rachel Laudan, who is a food historian and the author of uh, Cuisine and Empire, Cooking in World History. Uh, John Coupland, who is a uh, professor of food science at Penn State University, and also the president-elect of the Institute of Food Technologists. And Tamar Adler, uh, who is a New York Times columnist, the author of An Everlasting Meal, and also a contributor to Vogue. And uh, tonight's discussion will be moderated by Dave Arnold, who is the founder of the Museum of Food and Drink. Uh, really quickly, one last thing. There are also surveys in your program. So at the end of the evening, um, we'd like you to just take 30 seconds to fill that out, and we'll have people collecting them at the door. Thanks so much. Hi, so thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. So the, in general, for those of you that have been to one of our roundtables before, the rules are we are going to have a civil discussion. We're not going to talk over each other. Um, in general, that seems to work out and get a, a lot better. There'll be Q&A at the end. We're going to start out, everyone's going to you know, just speak for two minutes about kind of whatever they want to, hopefully about the subject at hand. And then uh, we'll ask them some questions and, and we'll go through. All right, so why don't we just, uh, we'll start with Stephanie and we'll, where she go? And we'll work on down the line. Okay. So I'm going to take a tactic from my artist toolbox and I'm going to talk about where I fall into this debate through um, the work that's being done in this field. And I'm gonna start by talking about where I fit, or where I think I fit into the spectrum of technology. I'm gonna use this term, appropriate technology, which was coined by the economist uh, Fritz Schumacher. And it actually was started by Gandhi um, in basically retaliation to uh, the colonization of the country. And so, in essence, what appropriate technology is. It's using technology at the small scale, it's decentralized, it's labor intensive, it's energy efficient, it's environmentally sound, and it's locally controlled. And I'm gonna talk about some artists who are doing what I think are appropriate technology type products, um, projects around food. So the first one's Mary Mattingly, and this is a project called Swale. It's gonna be launched here in the spring of 2016. And what it is is it's a floating food forest, and she's using technology, she's a sculptor, and she's using technologies, um, working with engineers, working with scientists, to create uh, a self-sufficient floating food system using the Hudson um, to filter the water and feed all the plants. This is a rendering of this. I'm gonna go really fast because we only get two minutes and I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> And then, <laughs> it's hard to be first. So this is Phil Ross. Phil Ross uh, coined this term mycotexture. And what he does is he uses fungus, um, the root-like structures underneath the ground. He found out that you can grow them into shapes that are water resistant, fire resistant, and bulletproof. Um, and if you use a certain kind of mushroom, you can actually boil it back down and drink it as a tea. And it's amazing. <laughs> Um, the artist Marina Zerko is using these technologies, the mycelium, to create these serving bowls to 
um, show off the dishes of jellyfish that she's been researching. Jellyfish is a food item that's going to become more and more popular only because climate change is making the waters really, really warm. So there's going to be more jellyfish, and they're a really good source of um, collagen. Bjornkorn's actually one of the sponsors tonight. It's a friend of mine who's a sculptor, and he created a really interesting Solaris basin made of mylar that pretty much cooks food in the ground by using the sun. And he started a company to fund this, to travel around the world and show people who um, either don't have access to technology or want to use cheaper technology to cook food on their own. And the popcorn is like crack. It's really good. This is the tree of 40 fruits. My friend Sam, he's a sculptor. He grafted 40 different kinds of stone fruit onto a tree so that it blooms all at the same time. And the goal behind the project is to get people excited about how many varieties there are that have been kind of swept under the rug because of monoculture. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is this uh, far, um, farm in the Netherlands. So it's Salt Farm Tessel. And what Tessel did was um, it's a very high, it's an area that's got a high level of salinity. And instead of getting involved in desalinization, which uses an incredible amount of fossil fuel, they worked with halophates, which are plants that do well in, a high, in an area of high salinity. And they found an heirloom potato that grows really, really well in the soil of high salinity. And the, the potato itself is not high in salt. If you tease a potato uh, with sugar, it releases, uh, with salt, it releases sugar. Um, one last thing I'm going to say, I don't know if I have time, but for me, the debate around food and technology has a lot to do with perception. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what food technology is, that there's a binary between good or bad, and that there's a lot of um, PR that's being done both positively and negatively. And a friend of mine got a card at a conference he was at just to show you how important perception is around these conversations. So this is somebody who's the director of millennial engagement around Monsanto. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Um, and to meet so many interested people. Uh, we are supposed to be a diverse group. As uh, I was introduced, I'm here to give a historical perspective. I spent most of my career teaching history of technology, not food, to engineering students. So my take is that it's not technology and or technology versus food and art. Techne the Greek word from which technology derives simply means know-how. We know how and we keep learning more about how to turn raw materials, carcasses and harvests, into foods and dishes that we put in our mouths. So a whistle-stop tour. 30,000 years ago, pestles used to reduce grains to flour and earth to pigments. 2,500 years ago, stone tanks and salt used to turn anchovies into fish sauce or garum that was branded and shipped around the Mediterranean. 500 years ago, crushing, boiling, clarifying with additives, turning sugar cane into the new magic ingredient sugar and that into translucent, rosy quince paste that rivaled the Venetian glass that was so popular at the time. All these and similar technologies uh, were applied to both food and art. They were time-consuming and energy-intensive and laborious. And then came industrialization, which at root means the addition of plentiful uh, fossil fuel, more power. A hundred years ago, flour pastes extruded with the help of hydraulic presses and dried in heated chambers made pasta more than a rarity, as concrete was used by Gaudi in his famous sculptural buildings. Fifty years ago, in honor of Mofad, um, the, whoops, we missed one. Uh, the uh, cereal gun produces instant breakfast for the American people. And 10 years ago, compressed nitrous oxide is used to make foams and new cocktails. My point, food processing, turning raw materials into food by some combination of changing size and shape, changing temperature, changing chemical makeup, and using micro, uh, microorganisms is one of our oldest and one of our most dazzling technologies. 
Food is made by art in the old sense of art and crafts. It is artful. It is an artifact. It is artificial. And think of the possibilities that opens for human creativity. We are and never have been like animals stuck with what is natural in food. And I think if we're to move on to talk about the new food ethics, food ethics, old or new, has to start with the fact that food is a human creation. Thank you very much. I think we'll Thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, my name's John Cooper. I'm a professor of food science, and it feels unusual for a food scientist to be here. When you talk amongst groups of our people, we feel these discussions going on, but nobody seems to be interested in the people who do the chemistry of food or interested in running breakfast cereal factories and the sort of mundane things that we take as common food. I think if I was going to try and add anything to this conversation, I would be to sort of critique how we build our criticisms of the, the modern food system. We're not talking about food processing here. We've been processing foods since before we, we were human. We're really talking about our worries about industrial food preparation. And when we talk about that, people always sort of say, oh, well, the industrial food system, it's great at providing tons of cheap, abundant calories, but I'd like us to all wait a little bit before we say but under those circumstances and think about what an astonishing thing that is. The fact that we do have large amounts of cheap food, that we can have a, a plentiful amounts of a huge variety of food that other generations would have killed for. Our modern food system has huge challenges that frighten me. But I think if we're going to offer any criticism of it, we should, we should recognize that the, the systems it replaced had probably bigger challenges than the, the ones we've got now. What we should perhaps do is try and appreciate the qualities of what we've got, what, what's, what it is about this unusual system that we've built, and then see if we can improve it to avoid the, the, the problems it's got without killing the great benefits that, it, that it's brought us. I think a lot of the time we talk and worry about food, we're not really talking about food. We're talking about the fact we're worried about modern society. We don't really know what's going on. It's big, it's complicated, and the chains and the webs that connect us are beyond any of our understandings. I think food does deserve special consideration in this context because it's something that happens to us all every day. It helps us form cultures, it helps us form friendships, it helps us build societies. But I think we should be very conscious as we do start to dissect this and improve these, these cultural aspects of food, that just delivering calories and variety at a low price to people is not a bad thing to do. Thank you. Hi. I want to prefatorily apologize for uh, hoarseness and looking like Inspector Gadget. <laughs> Kind of getting over a cold, but kind of still underneath the cold. Um, I sort of feel like I'm here as the um, representative Luddite. <laughs> and I'm not really a Luddite, but my entire food background uh, is in a response to the industrialized food system. I come from Chez Panisse, where we still use mortars and pestles instead of blenders, and where a fellow cook once asked for a, uh, an oil thermometer for his oil pot to fry french fries, and was laughed out of the room because one shouldn't need to gauge the temperature of one's oil pot. You just sort of you know, put a french fry in and you figure it out. That's the degree of sort of technological rejection that I come from. Um, and that's not where I've stayed. I think there is a lot of, I mean, technology is, as Rachel said, everything that we do. There's a lot of technology in the future of a sustainable food system. But I think I tend to approach everything in a caveman-like, slightly ideological way, which is good because, um, because it's a useful perspective as long as you stay sort of open. I, I think we're going to talk a lot more about food processing than we are about food production. But I recently encountered an argument that made an incredibly beautiful case for the importance of flavor in food, which has been one of the huge things that we've lost in the industrialization of the food system. And it was in this book, um, 
which has its drawbacks, but, but this, this argument isn't one of them. Um, and the argument that it made was that flavor brings nutrition and that when we started thinking about good ways to get many calories into many houses, something that we lost was this thing that we considered hedonic and aesthetic, but in fact was incredibly important nutritionally. And what I like about his path towards solving this problem is that it was technological. And um, he talks about plant breeding as a solution, really high-tech, amazing plant breeding, because we bred flavor and nutrition out so we can breed it back in um, to all of our foods. And there's no reason it can't be low cost and widely available. Um, and uh, so I was excited about that. And I was excited about the fact that I was excited about technology um, in some way, even if it was seed-based. And, and I don't think we're going to talk a ton about it. In the next 30 seconds, Emma is going to roll video from this sweet documentary that came out um, that just has a little good moment about plant breeding. Um, where there's flavor, there are nutrients. Where there are nutrients, there is health. The plant breeders have been under the same kind of pressure that we put the farmers under to increase yields as much as possible. And so when you focus just on breeding for higher yields, then of course you're not breeding for food quality. When you breed for flavor, you're breeding for health. It's not anti-technology, it's not Luddite, it's not going back to caveman breeding. This is like using the, the, the future, but using it appropriately. I am not a farmer, I'm a parent. I'm a resident and I'm a teacher. And from day one, we are growing in my classroom. And my kids from the poorest congressional district in America became the first to install the first edible wall in New York City. So if you're hungry, get up and eat. And that's the food. Where does it go? Zero miles to plate, right down into the cafeteria. Or more importantly, to local shelters where most of my kids are getting one to two meals a day. And we're stepping it up. We started installing these walls in schools that look like this, with lighting like that, 21st century technology. And what do you know? We made 21st century money. And that was groundbreaking. And what does it really do? It teaches kids to revision their communities. So when they grow up in places like this, they can imagine it like this. It's called Food for Thought, Food for Life. And it's by Susan Rockefeller. And it's out and about short. You can download it. That's it. <laughs> Okay, so where, where to begin? Okay, so the park is waiting to go down. So, uh, you know, Stephanie, you, you mentioned um, kind of a use of appropriate technology, and clearly, you know, you're fascinated with technology and, and like the use of it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, you know, in an interview you did, you referred to industrial food and the mechanisms uh, involved with it as veiled, corrupt, and the labyrinthine beast that I have spent countless hours down the rabbit hole trying to figure it all out and uncover the extreme lack of transparency involved with it. What? And I'm not even close. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, so like, there's, there's a, like, there's a, there's a, uh, oh, not working, I can just be louder. So like, clearly you're conflicted about this and there's some notion of good versus bad technology, right? So like, what's the, what's the difference? And I know you also don't like to, to have things broken into dichotomies, right. but, you, but there is this uncomfortable feeling about the use of certain technologies. I want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so I think, I'm gonna try not to get myself in trouble. Is your mic good? Yeah. Is this, can you all hear me? Okay, um, I think I'm gonna to try to address as much of that uh, answer as possible. And I think the easiest way to distill it would be to talk about um, thinking about technology in terms of a system. So there's a thing in design called systems thinking where when you're talking about a topic, you try to bring in as many stakeholders as, you, as are relevant to the topic. So when you talk about the food system, for example, you can't talk about the food system without talking about water or migrant labor or policy, that a lot of these things are really interconnected. And when I look at the impact of technology on the food system, what I start to see is how fossil fuels are being used indiscriminately in order to produce an incredible amount of food, which, as John pointed out, is really important. But I wonder if we could start to rethink how we produce food at this level. Why not use solar power? Why not use some of the technologies that I showed in my short little presentation that I think it's not the technology that I have a problem with, but it's oftentimes the fuel or how it's being um, run or the mechanization behind it. And then the other part too is how are these technologies affecting our environment? That a lot of the technology tends to corrupt the biodiversity, tends to disrupt ecosystem. And I think at the end of the day, I'm gonna 
co-opt um, what Tamar said, which is taste. That in pursuit of all of this industrial food production, we have lost taste. So it's not just the um, aesthetic um, notion of taste, but it's also the tasteful way in which we think about how our actions impact the environment. So for me, it's about balancing our need to feed ourselves, our desire for our food to taste good, but also how are we really taking care of the planet vis-a-vis -vis the resources that we're using. That's all right. And then before I go down and let other people respond, did you taste the fruit in that tree? Was it good? Yeah. Oh, He's nice. Like the map. So Sam's become, you guys should look up the projects, the tree of 40 fruit. He's become in the area like the master plum guy. So he knows all the heirloom plums and all of the plum farmers now go to him. He's become such an expert on plums because he's managed to figure out how to grow plums that taste really, really good. So it's not just about this tree being such a spectacle, but the food actually tastes as good as it looks. So yeah. yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to sidetrack. Yeah, so we go down and uh, you want to make comments on the kind of good technology, bad technology? Uh, two comments. Um, one, just to the, the flavor issue. Um, when I was a kid, I lived on a farm, and I had a green gauge tree outside my window espaliered on the wall. And I tell you, those green gauges, I still dream about them. You can't get them in America. They're the best of the plums. You get two a year. Um, most of the year, uh, flavor was much harder to come by um, because, unfortunately, fruit, um, like many other things, has a season, and I think I, I'm not convinced of this one way or the other, but I think it's an open question whether our flu food is less flavorful overall. Uh, second, on um, the uh, technology, I think it would be great if we could re-engineer our system um, with all the uh, new um, intelligent technology there is to reduce the cost of labor. But the fact is that it is just incredibly labor intensive. Uh, or energy intensive, just take grains. Grains are the basis of the diet for a reason, and that reason is that they are hard and store well through the winter. And breaking up grains, if you, and I apologize if any of you have heard me use this metaphor before, no, story before, in Mexico, uh, until recently, and I learned to do it, it took a woman five hours a day to grind the grains for a family. Um, that's not because they're backward, they grind wet. And you cannot, it's very hard to grind wet with machinery. So I want to uh, say that uh, I would love to see appropriate technology, but until we find ways of uh, producing the enormous amounts of force, other than human force or animal force or wind or water force, to turn things into food, um, I am going to stick with fossil fuels. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, uh, my peach tree in my garden went crazy this year and I made more peach jam than I've ever had before. I could have brought some for everybody. It really is very good. Uh, it was one fun to make as well. I don't think it was an efficient thing to do though. Working in my own kitchen, um, it took me a lot of energy, a lot of time to make that peach jam. I know people who work in, con in, in jam factories and they've got the process of boiling it and condensing it down to a fine art and they're far more efficient than me in making that peach jam. I think mine's better, but I think we need to be, I, I like the idea of appropriate technology, but I think it, we need to be thoughtful about what it means and willing to accept that sometimes it's not going to be pretty. It might be a big factory on the outskirts of a small town that you've never heard of. It might not be um, as sort of local and aesthetically appealing as some of the pictures we like to show ourselves. Tamar? Okay, working backwards. It's, I mean, it's interesting that you talked about the, the peach jam <coughs> making in terms of efficiency, because something I was thinking about... Excuse me, Pavel, could you speak into your mic so you can have the mic down? Sorry. Yes. We'll just use this. I apologize. No, this is good. <laughs> My oversight. Um, what I had started 
to address was um, John's experience of peach jam making. And something that I realized, and I was thinking about earlier today because I was thinking about what Rachel has written um, about using, what's, it, what's that called? The, the, the traditional, matate? the matate, yeah. Um, which is the stone slab that Mexican women used to use to, to make the masa on. Um, was that, you know, that is incredibly grueling physical labor that I think you would have a hard time calling anything much other than physical labor, no matter its, um, no matter its results, good tortillas. Um, but I was thinking about, I was looking around my kitchen, which is a, not a terribly technologically advanced kitchen. I just got a Vitamix um, yesterday. And it was, it's like the, you know, the one machine I have, and it looks completely out of place. And I was realizing that I, I think that a lot of the time, I'm not talking about in traditional Mexican culture, but a lot of the time in our culture today, we assume that things, we, we call things labor that might be called uh, other activities. For instance, I wonder what time, what you would be doing with the time that you didn't spend making your peach jam that would be so much better. Because yes, it's, yes, yes, yes. it's, you know, you probably had a good time, and I don't know how good a time you have doing other things, but that was probably <laughs> a good time. And so... Should I let him respond? Yeah, actually, you know what? Uh, that's, I think, an important Sorry. question. So I think okay. I'm going to let that ricochet back here before I ask another question. So keep going, and we'll just let the response to whether or not there was a better thing to be doing with his time than making okay. peach jam. Okay. <laughs> um, really, really good point. No, there isn't. I, I, the, the best thing I did with this fall. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. Is this working at all? Um, that making peach jam was a, a super thing to do. But I'm not confusing the... So, pleasure I got of being with my children making peach jam and, and working myself with the fact that I'm efficiently making calories. The fact I could do that was, I think, because... Use that, John, use that. Because... I think the, the, the fact I was able to do that was because I can buy my bread at, at the supermarket, I can buy my meat at the supermarket, I can buy my milk at the local creamery. Um, that freed up the time. But uh, yes, it's a wonderful thing to do, and I, I don't want to dismiss that at all. I'm so sorry for cutting you off. So I think it's not about whether or not food is available, like you said, for the bread. So buying bread and buying meat allows you to make the jam. I think the other side of the equation has to do with when we get the food we get in terms of seasons, so the seasonality of certain foods. So we might have to make compromises in terms of how we use the technology. So like you said, until we get a better form of um, energy in order to run some of these industrial food producing uh, factories. But why not make other changes around when we expect certain foods to be in our lives? Like why do we have to have strawberries in February? That if we were to reduce the amount of energy to grow and ship and package strawberries in February in New York, that there may be ways to funnel some of that energy into producing other foods that might not take that, um, uh, that won't take away from our experience of enjoying food. I have no problem with eating seasonal food. Um, I think it would mean um, if, uh, if we were to go to local food, I think it would mean, a re unless we live in California, uh, a reduction in a diet that is very hard for contemporary people to imagine. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that this, that that actually segues well into um, a thing that I was thinking about the flavor conversation, which was that, so this, you know, I, I really hadn't read this argument until I read this particular book, and I've, I've heard it floating around since. Dan, Dan Barber, who was in that video, also um, has made it. And, and apparently there is fairly good science showing that our food has become less flavorful, even if that is just gauged on a nutrient level, a micronutrient level. Uh, that I'm talking about large-scale food in the United States right now. Um, you know, tomatoes, broccoli, uh, peaches, spinach, stuff like that. And I think that it's important to draw a distinction between getting to have two or three green-gauge 
plums a year, which is incredible, and a prioritization of flavor in the breeding of food that has been supported at various points by um, by the government, as I mean, as it sort of has had to be. There's there was apparently this uh, contest in the 1940s, maybe it was in 1940, uh, sponsored by Purdue for the chicken of tomorrow, and all of these breeders from all over the country bred chicks to create, you know, a, a better chick to feed this growing America, and among all of the rubrics that upon which they judged the chickens, the absent one was flavor. So they did um, growth time, um, you know, feed efficiency, uh, size of breasts, you know, the, the things that you see in your chickens now, they didn't include flavor. So we've ended up with most of our chickens being these Cornish crosses that, that get bred very quickly. It's also turned out that the that people eat less of the older breed chickens because they satisfy micronutrient needs that lead to satiety that are not just, I eat, I get calories, I get full. And that's really meaningful, um, particularly when a lot of the problem that we're facing in an industrialized food system is the way Americans deal with our food. You know, it was really something that I loved in this, in this book and in this argument in general was that what if people eating Doritos was essentially the same thing that moves those of us who have access to locally grown um, greens and locally grown tomatoes to eat those things, which is a search for flavor, which um, creates a kind of feedback. What if mm -hmm. humans are designed to find flavor and will kind of like find it where we can get it, which is a really cool argument and has been observed in goats. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a brilliant thought, and it has escaped me. I'm, I, I, I confess to being slightly concerned about um, the breeding for flavor. Um, one thing, um, I remember when I first came to America, I got Woman's Day, or one of those magazines at the uh, checkout counter, and they had the best of the best competition. And the first one was corned beef hash, and the next one was apple pie, and then they dropped it. And I came to the conclusion the reason was that there were angry letters after every uh, apple pie and corned beef hash because everybody had a different idea of what the ideal flavored apple pie and corned beef hash was going to be. I think, it, I mean, flavorful, I think. Is it, it's a maybe you know uh, we've got down certain aspects of flavorful, and I think also John's earlier point about cheap uh, uh, economical calories matters. Um, but that wasn't the brilliant point. So if it comes to me, I'll let you know. Give you guys a new ball to toss around. Um, so Rachel, this one, uh, this one for you as a. As an historian, I want you to take this one on as an historian. So I think there's a general feeling about uh, uh, that a lot of people have that our current uh, food system is on the verge of some sort of catastrophic, breaking, meltdown, nightmare, apocalyptic, Mad Max kind of a situation. And do you believe that's the case? And and even if you did believe it's the case, do you believe as a, as a student of history of technology that we'll somehow technology our way out of it? Have we reached the end of our ability to figure out our problems by just coming up with new ideas? Oh my goodness. Um, do I think the food system is on the point of apolitic, it's always been on the point of apolitic breakdown. I mean, um, luckily none of us have had to face famines. Um, none of us have experienced the hunger season that everybody experienced until about 150 years ago um, before the harvest came in and last year's supplies had pretty much run out. So um, the main aim of the food system since the beginning has been to avoid apocalypse. And in the last hundred years, we've really done rather well at avoiding that kind of apocalypse, perhaps at uh, the cost of the environment um, and at uh, 
possibly at the cost of flavor, I don't know. But I, yes, I think we technology our way out of it. If we can build iPhones, um, we can continue, I think, to do really exciting things. I mean, it, it's really important to get this point that food is not natural. Because the feeling that it's gone too far or it's bad or we've got to get back to something um, assumes that there was a natural state that was really um, good. And we left that thousands of years ago. So we agreed as a panel not to talk about GMOs, and I'm not going to, but... <laughs> just for like a second. Um, <laughs> I think the, to address your question about how we're going to technology our way out of it or how we've technologied our way out of the past 100 years. So when Norman Burlock created the um, Green Revolution, right? Okay. Yeah. No, it was great. No, it was great. I'm a huge fan. I think where I stopped becoming a fan was when capitalism kind of co-opted the technology, took it in a really problematic direction and started exploiting this technology for the purpose of profit. So I think that there's an issue around how technology, how, how, I know, uh-oh, how technology, it's okay, I'm ready, how, <laughs> how technology can be measured, which goes back again to this appropriate technology, which is not my term, but I'm, I'm not against technology at all. I use it in my work, I use it in my life, I teach technology. I think it's, a, it's who who's using the technology and how they're using the technology. And I think that there's just not enough attention on the collateral damage that a lot of these technologies do in the service of keeping us alive, which is, ne which is a necessity. Um, yeah. And John, you want to uh, I think, I think so. Just very briefly, uh, I think it's very easy in these kind of discussions to find you're not talking about food anymore. That I think the things that we're frightened of are modernity, we're frightened of the environment, we're frightened of capitalism. Um, I don't think food deserves a special place in those worries. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are absolutely worries about it, but there are good things about it too. I, I don't have much more to add. Well, I suppose only that I don't agree that food doesn't deserve a special place in it, and I don't uh, need to spend a ton of time disagreeing with that one point, but I... I disagree with it, I think, in the same vein as what Stephanie was saying, um, which is that it might be that there is a field in which um, profit shouldn't particularly be made. And it may be that food is a bad thing to have function as a commodity. And it may be that it's a, not economically efficient on an on industrial scale. Um, or that's not what I mean. I, you can take things back. I take it back. <laughs> what I mean is that, as I guess what I said before, and I don't think it's being scared of capitalism. I think it's being scared of overly um, capitalismizing food um, and over, you know, free tradeizing food. We've seen this go bad. It's got, it went really bad in Mexico. I mean, um, and uh, I mean, in terms of the amount of Mexican corn that is American corn now, which is over 70%. That's mainly animal feed. Mexico is practically self sufficient in uh, tortilla food. <laughs> Rachel knows appreciate. more about. Okay, sorry, I'll, I'll sorry, I didn't mean. No, no, no. Okay. I, but Rachel knows more about that than me, so she's, I'm sure, right. Um, but uh, I think that it. I wasn't there for the agreement that we wouldn't talk about GMOs. I didn't come for that. <laughs> well, just that, you know, like a, a good example of whether or not we can technology our way out of it is the golden rice conversation. And I was rereading today Michael Pollan's 2001 piece, which is great, about golden rice. Um, and he has a really wonderful line in it, which is that it may be the world's first purely rhetorical technology. Um, and what he meant by that was that there are a lot of less glamorous ways to solve um, the absence of beta carotene in um, the cultures that would end up you know benefiting from uh, golden rice but and they would cost a lot less money than the hundred billion dollars that in two thousand and one had been poured into uh, golden rice research. Those are still technologies. There are tons of existing technologies, including giving out vitamin supplements. Um, 
you know, which need technology to get there and also get created. But whether or not they're the sexiest technologies is, I think, a different question. You want to you leave that hang? you have anything? Uh, I can just ask more questions. I'm not a universal expert. I know where my ideas lie, probably on golden rice, but I try to stick to topics that... Yeah, we're not, yeah well, we won't get into the GMO now, although, yes, we won't get into the GMO now. Um, so, uh, you, you can hear my mic's working, right, somewhat? I'll use this guy. So, uh, uh, John, to you, it seems uh, like recently uh, bigger food uh, corporations and kind of industrial food uh, uh, concerns have realized that there's a big consumer desire to shift towards things like natural foods, things without artificial uh, uh, colorings and flavorings, to the point where someone like Taco Bell is erasing a lot of these things out of their menu. Uh, my question is, um, is there going to be any real difference in that food? Is this, is this kind of an oxymoron like sustainable industrial food? Is it just a co-opting? Is it good? Is it bad? Feelings? Thoughts? Um, I don't think my microphone works. Uh, yeah, this is, there's quite a significant trend now to try and sort of remove artificial from foods and sell natural foods. I don't think we're really moving from the industrial food paradigm at all in any of this stuff. If you brought in some toxicologists from the CSPI, they would come up with specific <laughs> arguments about specific additives, and I wouldn't argue with them on that. But I think if you're, from the point of view of running a company like Chipotle or, or Taco Bell, or making your GM-free Cheerios, you're just trying to recognize what consumers seem to value. I think it's, it's always important. We often think of the food industry as selling their crap to us. I think the food industry spends as much time trying to worry about what you want and give you that. So when you have this nervousness around industrial food, there's a tendency to sort of pretend it isn't industrial food, to put a picture of a little red barn on the front or a happy grandma <laughs> rolling out the cookies. Um, whereas I think the thing that's... I think we should celebrate industrial food is the big machines and the factories. And I'm not, I think that's a good thing. I think it gives us space to do some of these food rituals, which I think are really valuable and help us connect and, be, and form societies. But I think the tendency of big food to dress itself up as a small food is, is just another form of capitalism. And I think you can see the same thing in like smaller upstart food companies. Uh, trying to claim some sort of major ethical advantage in what they're trying to do. They're just trying to sell food. And um, good luck to them. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to crack that, or should I ask one last question? Because we're going to move to Q&A pretty soon. Okay. All right. All right, so one last. Uh, this one, is, Tamara, I haven't asked you a direct question yet. So. Uh, isn't like, and this comes from someone who also likes to do ridiculously uh, absurd things in the kitchen in terms of, of labor. I just enjoy doing it. But isn't that because we are members of an elite that allow us to spend our time in the kitchen doing all sorts of fun stuff like this? I'm not saying it's as bad as Marie Antoinette milking cows, but aren't we kind of in that kind of a zone where we are allowed to be Luddites because we have money and time? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> and, and, and are you okay with that? <laughs> Am I okay with what? Well, with the fact that, I mean, in other words, it, it, is there some sort of trickle down in the future for this, or is it just the practice of a group of people who have the time and energy and money to do it? Well, I, I'm not sure that there's a discrete this in what you said. I mean, I think that depending on whether or not it's your peach tree and the rest of your diet and what the rest of your life involves, making peach jam may be a hobby project for which you need to have it's really a good peach tenure. Jam. <laughs> I, I'm sure it is. <laughs> um, you know, for which you need to have a, a, a job and free time, or it could be a totally worthwhile thing to do. I certainly don't, I, I'm a, I love using canned foods. I'm a uh, great, you know, personal, advocate and supporter of a lot of things that make uh, that make cooking take less time um, and I don't think there's I, I sort of think that's a subjective you know do whatever you want to do you should do thing I what, what I'm more interested in is the ways in which um, we've as a society put an enormous amount of resources into um, into values, into food values that don't benefit 
the people they're meant, we claim they benefit as much as they benefit the companies that produce them. I think that's often the case. It's like, it took an enormous spending campaign. It always takes huge campaigns to convince people to use whatever the new technology is. Like a lot of that money could go toward all sorts of other things. We have huge subsidies that could go toward people learning how to cook. You know, like also cooking takes less time if you're good at it. Um, so there, I think it's sort of like this, it, it's too, too big a question, but I definitely think um, you shouldn't feel like you need to, you know, can tomatoes if you don't have time to can tomatoes. Can I pivot off of something? So I think there's something in there you're talking about in terms of um, the way in which companies sell their foods, right? And sort of the stuff, the barn on the package that you were talking about. And I think that's also where I take issue with large-scale industrial food marketing. Um, not necessarily production, but a lot of the marketing around this. Um, there's an anecdote that I like to tell my students about how this is in regards to how the FDA has a real hands-off policy around the health claims that companies make on the food products that they sell. They have to, um, companies have to comply with certain nutritional um, components, but there's an anecdote about Kellogg's Frosted Mini Wheats that I like to tell that used to say on their box, kids who ate Frosted Mini Wheats for breakfast did 20% better in school than kids who didn't. So the Environmental Working Group and the Center for Food Safety investigated that claim. And it turns out that it was an internal study done by Kellogg's in which they got two groups of kids and one group got Kellogg's Frosted Mini Wheats for breakfast and the other group got nothing. <laughs> and then sent them to school. And <laughs> it's an effective story. The, the, the problem with the story is that, you know, you have a single parent with three children and four jobs trying to do right by their children, and they read the package that says, well, the government, this must be true because this must be vetted by some organization that is looking out for my best interests. And it turns out that there isn't. And I think that for me, there's a huge disconnect between how a lot of this food is presented, how this food is um, sold, and how it ends up um, in a very dangerous place in terms of how we feed our children. Any quick last licks before Q&A? I, 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 you go first. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to defend that. That's awful. Um, I think we've got a... <laughs> I, I think we've got a tendency to want to believe food has magical values to it as well. And it's a breakfast cereal. It's perhaps not the best thing to eat, but it's going to stop you being hungry. But, there's a temp but because we want to sort of associate these, these great moral values with food as well, then putting barns on the front is, or, or, or making these sort of healthfulness claims just silly is a temptation for food companies. I wouldn't just lay it at the door of big food, though. I think small food's very, very prone to doing this as well. This sort of local, artisanal, small batch. Don't it's worry. still breakfast cereal. Come on, it's... Um... <laughs> I agree. Yes, um, and um, I think I would respect if, uh, respectfully disagree that it's likely, it would be lovely, I would love to see a food system without profit. Um, it has been tried. Um, the great debate of the 20th century was between um, communal food under the Soviet system and the American system. Maybe we can go back to that. I was, no, no, seriously. I mean, I, I really see a lot of value in communal eating and communal food and communal food production. But at the moment, it doesn't seem to be on the table. And I think there's another big player, um, and that's the state. It's not just big companies and consumers, but uh, the government is very much in there as well. Um, and I think it always, because we tend to just see it in these terms of two groups, consumers and producers, and not the, not the government. All right, so you'll all have time for finishing statements, but right now we'd like to open it up, produce some Q&A. Uh, Emma, you need the mic? Over 50 years, I don't know if this is on, but. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Nice. Uh, over 50 years ago, C.P. Snow uh, admonished his intellectual friends who were 
romanticizing the pre-industrial era in, in general uh, to the point that there was the unconscious assumption on their part that they would be the nobleman living in the castle, not the serf living in starvation waiting for the crop to come in the next spring. And I think we see a lot of that still going on half a century later. And um, if capitalism is not there to um, exploit that, as someone put it, well, then at best you end up with uh, a, a Yugo or a Trabant. I enjoy walking. There are those who enjoy making peach jam, but uh, which is a good thing. Uh, it also occasionally gets me from point A to point B, but I'm not advocating replacing the automobile with walking. Uh, it would set us back as, again, as C.P. Snow pointed out, not 10 percent, but 90 to 99 percent. And uh, I don't think anyone really wants to do that. Um, and again, is it, a, it is, as someone pointed out, a conceit of those who can afford it. Uh, I've had friends who had dinner at Chez Panisse, and they pointed out that the dinner cost them more than the flight from New York to California. So. So since they mentioned the restaurant, you want to take that one on then? Is, uh, is this, you want to re rebut or no? You just want to? Was there a question? <laughs> oh, I see him. All right. Yeah, no. Okay. okay. Uh, there's another hand up there in the back. Um, hi. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief background to give you context about my question. Um, I'm a former banker and currently I'm a food activist and I've been trying for the last three years to figure out a way to change the food system. And the best way I figured out was actually marketing, bringing out awareness about what's good and what's right and what's fact and what's not. Um, I've also been recently doing a trail of the beef process system because that seems to be the most controversial commodity. Um, I visited two months ago a feedlot. And it was a feedlot which had, and before going in, I was completely against the whole industrial beef production system. And I had read about all of the things, including Michael Boland's book about the atrocities of a feedlot. What I witnessed there was not what was written in literature and what everybody says, which gave me pause to consider what is everything that we are reading in media really true. And what was more interesting was this particular feedlot in the middle of Nebraska. Um, most of their um, the cattle were under the regular system, but they did have a part of it which supplied to Whole Foods, therefore organic and high standards. What he said essentially was, we are willing to do, as feedlot owners, do anything that we need, as long as the consumer tells us that this is what they want. So if you want more organic meat, great, just pay that extra amount because we need that much more to produce it. And going back to the question of capitalism, Inherently, it doesn't offer any kind of an, uh, structure to abuse. It is basically a free trade where there's demand and there's supply. As long as there's a, supply, a demand coming in from the consumer, there, is, there will be supply that will you know, feed, feed that. And within the question of technology as well, as much as technology has enabled cheap food access, there are people who need that food. But there are also people who willingly do not choose to cook at home, even though technology can make it easier for them to access better quality food, so to speak, even within our egalitarian way of looking at it. So my question really is to both Stephanie and Tamar is, it's not really about technology. It's about people and them making a choice, which, well, or not making a choice to be conscious of what they're putting into themselves. So why should we blame the government, the in investors, or the produ production companies for something that we have a right and responsibility to ourselves? Do you want to start? Um, I'll respond first, uh, but briefly. And I was, it, I, I, I was just thinking of the fact that Rachel said before that she wasn't going to speak about anything about which she wasn't an expert. And I realized that if I held myself to that role, I wouldn't be able to talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <Wow>. forgive me. <laughs> so uh, forgive me because I'm not. You know, I write about food and cooking, and I have no credentials. Um, 
so I know less than I should and would like to. But I don't think it's... I don't think it's true that it's a completely free market. There are massive subsidies for corn, and they're not small, I mean, for corn and soybeans. And if we subsidized other feed, or if we subsidized land stewardship, or we subsidized land conservation, the entire price structure of meat would shift. And that's just like the simplest answer because it's it's did not at all representative of anything right now and if there were anything like carbon offsets for the amount of water that get used to produce even the best run feedlot um it would cost it would be exorbitant uh how many gallons of water does it take to raise a pound of beef uh, you know a bajillion that's there's a fact one bajillion gallons of water <laughs> yeah per pound of beef you know and we just don't it's um, and that starts to get into the real cost of food stuff. But very basically, you know, uh, that amount of water could be calculated in and farms could have to pay for it. And you would see the entire um, price structure shift. So I'll just do that. I don't know if they're willing to. I just think a lot of them can't. I was just at a market in the West Village today and chicken breasts were $20 for a small organic package of chicken breasts. And I know the West Village is a Tony neighborhood, but it doesn't mean that people who are passing through that neighborhood or live in that neighborhood in rent-controlled apartments from the 70s shouldn't be able to make a decision that isn't going to bankrupt them. So I think to put the blame on the consumer about the choices makes an argument that's a little bit bi a binary, to use that word again, that pe that Sometimes people make decisions because they have to think about their wallet. Sometimes people make decisions because they have all the information in front of them and they can make an informed decision. And I think there's also a lot of people who can't make informed decisions because there's a lot of effort put forth by corporations, whether they're small or large, to put forth the best, most attractive product into the market without thinking about how it's going to impact the consumer. So I think when you ask, shouldn't the consumer dictate what's being bought and sold? Yeah, if the market were a little bit more fair, I would say absolutely. I just think at this point it's, a, it's veiled and imbalanced. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I like Tamar's point very much there. I think we've got to be very cautious about claiming there are free markets when a lot of what exists is because what already exists and what interests have led this agri, agro system to develop the way it is. Um, I'd also like to dodge the question of feedlots a little bit because when you start talking about animals, then you open all kinds of different difficult ethical questions around animal agriculture. But I would like to call attention to the, the virtue of a feedlot, uh, pretending there are no animals in it, that um, it's, bi <laughs> 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 um, it's big. A nice thing about a big operation run by people who really, really worry about efficiency is they can respond to a demand for cows that are fed a certain way, a, doubt, a, a desire for organic Cheetos, a desire for, um, I don't know, food which is colored with a different type of chemical. Um, again, coming back to this idea of factories and expertise that would be much harder to respond to at a smaller scale. Small scale certainly has virtues, but, s but large scale and expertise and industrialization has other virtues too. Uh, I, I was thinking about Rachel's answer about um, technologizing our way out of problems and also the idea about you know, capitalist thing, you know, if people have enough demand, we'll create the supply. And I'm just wondering if you would all have those same answers if we focused on fishing industry around the world. Because that seems to me an example for a second, people thought factory farming of fish were, was going to solve everything, and it turns out there are a host of problems with that. So it doesn't seem like a, and of course, there are big, you know, areas where, where fishing has been become decimated. So I'm just wondering, it doesn't seem that even if we have more dollars that we want to spend on fish, that we can just keep necessarily doing what we're doing and technologize our way out of it. At least that's what I know. I'm just wondering what you think. 
Me in particular? Um, again, um, I, I, I read stories about fish farming. Um, I don't know the details. I mean, I do think there is a room for government um, or international um, agreements about fishing. Um, I can imagine that it, the wild fish supply is simply inadequate to the world, but I have nothing particular to uh, of uh, inform to say about that particular issue. Um, can we te get technology out of every single specific question? Maybe not. Maybe there are some things we can't do. But that's not an argument for overall rejection of technological solutions. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think fishing, it's looking so awful in all kinds of demand, in all kinds of directions. I think some of the, there's been some successes with fish farming, there's been some less successful stuff going on. I was speaking to a professor of chemistry at the University of Iceland who decided that an efficient way of growing tilapia was to ship tilapia up to Iceland. You could warm the water with volcanic heat. And they never went into the sea at all. It was kind of like a, fish, a feedlot for fish. Um, I don't know if that's the solution. Um, but I f uh, perhaps fishing is just going to be one of those things that we remember. Tilapia is never the solution. <laughs> Which makes sense. In the, in the back there. Hi. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm, uh, I work for the Specialty Food Association, and we're an association of largely small manufacturers of uh, new, innovative packaged goods in the U.S. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about this discussion is how incredibly academic it is. Uh, I'm wondering if it, the discussions might be better if you also injected um, amongst the very, you know, people from very respected fields, like the historian, I don't know what kind of academician you are, but uh, a food writer in the New York Times, um, and some in the artistic field. There are a lot of <clears throat> people in the food chain right now, especially in those areas of food innovation, that are thinking very hard about technology. Uh, they're not talking about whether technology should be there or not. Um, this seems to be incredibly academic and probably doesn't get to the heart of what is the true uh, issue right now is how far <clears throat> our food production probably has gone to eliminate things like diversity of, of flavor, diversity of uh, nutritional profiles. If you actually go to some of the trade uh, meetings around the country right now where there is a lot of talk around innovation, the level of discussion and discourse is much higher and the, uh, I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but I think for those people who are interested in the whole dynamic of the role of technology, the role of food uh, and flavor, and diversity of what we actually have in our food environment. You need, to, you need to actually talk to people who are doing production right now, and people who are at the beginning of the food chain with farmers, the people who actually uh, are starting new companies because they do see that there's a lack of diversity in our, our industrially produced food, but also understand that there are techniques there. They, ha they actually have to feed people, right? So there are very hard decisions that these, people, that these people make. I happen not to be a food producer. I'm actually relatively new to the industry. I'm in, you know, I'm in digital technology, but having been involved in a lot of these, or listening to these people in the last two years uh, that I've been involved, the level of discourse outside of academia seems to be very, very sophisticated. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of these, these people here who are interested in food might actually benefit from listening to what the real struggles of people are who are actually producing food. Well, from the museum standpoint, I think those would be interesting discussions to have. I think it's a different, different discussion. Uh, you know, I, I go to a lot of those things and listen to the, the people. I think the actual I think it is a hugely interesting and val valid and uh, fascinating thing, people who actually have their boots on the ground in the industry. I think, it's, I think it's a different discussion. I think here we're focused more on, in general, um, raising issues not of how are we going to get things done, but of finding people who are on different sides of a fence having 
disagreements about kind of larger uh, policy related issues. So it's not so much the the same thing, but I think it's a valid point. And I, we, I would love to hear those voices because I think that they're interesting, interesting folks. I couldn't agree more on the few occasions when I've managed to get access to the food industry, which as an academic is extraordinarily hard to do and also extraordinarily dangerous, as you will know if you follow the controversy around Kevin Falter in the last few weeks. In the, those times when I have been uh, engaged, and John has been engaged a lot more than I have, um, he's... Um, I have found extremely knowledgeable and extremely thoughtful people whom I have learned a lot from. So my question back to you is, why aren't they out there um, responding to the massive amount of uh, output in the media that is largely critical of their enterprise? Can I try and answer that? I've got a microphone, you haven't. Um, I think there's a tendency for food industry people to not talk about food science to the general public because of this whole sort of red barn and grannies type thing. And I think it's a terrible pity. I think if we understood the costs and challenges of actually making this industrial system work, we might be able to criticize it better. Um, we sometimes, when we get into these kind of conversations, we look for like big picture solutions. What's the answer that's going to get us out of this thing? I think we would do better to try and value the small scale efficiencies that make this machine work. I was talking to a graduate of our program who works for a small, a, a big bakery in Pennsylvania. And he worked on screening systems to stop it, little rocks get in from the flour into the processing line. Because they, they have a standard test for this stuff. If they have too many rocks, they send a truckload of flour back, and it's massive food waste. And nobody cares about that stuff. The, but that stuff, it, that's really doing something about food waste. I mean, you could argue about whether we should eat more cakes or less cakes. But that was a good thing to do, and it's not valued. There's going to be a chicken processing plant somewhere in rural, rural Alabama, and we're all going to be worrying about... Is it ethical to kill chickens? Is it ethical to raise chickens that way? Do they have the right taste? All these sort of big picture questions, which we should talk about. But in that plant, there's going to be a food microbiologist running a HACCP plan to make sure that the, 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 the material's clean, to make sure that it's sanitized, to make sure the worker training's in place, to make sure there's a process to make this industrial machinery work. I think we need to learn to be more interested in this small-scale minutia. Very often, processed food is a bit like drains. People always rather not think about it too much, but complain if it, if, if it gives you a problem. Um, we really depend on these, on these scientific experts working in unglamorous places to make this thing work for us. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hear your point. But I think as an audience, we need to be more willing to listen to it. Hi. Um, I thought that the discussion on flavor was very important, but I think also that there are different levels of flavor here that are being not being named, and I would like to address that a little bit. There's the flavor of the fruit off the tree. That is a matter of breeding and, and culture. When people were pioneers, they, they, uh, they put on their trees more than 50 different kinds of, of plums or peaches or apples or whatever to see what would grow in this new place that they were settling um, and which ones worked, not only by flavor, but which ones didn't get frosted when the spring temperatures dropped, et cetera, et cetera. That's one level of flavor. What happens to the food by the time you've made jam out of it, or you've harvested the grain and you've made bread out of it, or whatever, is another level of flavor. And one of the problems that I am very concerned about at the moment, and I don't know much about it, because there isn't much information, at least available to me, is that I think that what's happening in terms of flavor is in part unintended consequences. That in processed food, 
we are used to seeing on the label artificial flavor. And now people have done the work so that they can call the compounds that they have put through the process natural flavor or some other euphemism for exactly the same chemicals probably. But in any case, whatever chemicals they are, they're chemicals. And they've been through the same industrial process. And we don't have a clue what they are or what they're doing to us or anybody else in the process of making them. And uh, so if we're going to talk about flavor that's not part of the individual and beginning ingredient, I think that's where uh, technology needs some real attention. Um, I ban the word natural and artificial from food. I just think it's almost always there to mislead to some extent. But taking your broader question about flavorings, yes, there's a whole massive range of molecules which are added to food. Sometimes they're extracted from the plants and added back into the plant. So when you drink orange juice, it's all orange juice, but it's been separated and put back together multiple, multiple times. I think we can ask ourselves a question is, do we worry about it particularly when it's treated as a chemical versus treated as part of a food? So in an awful lot of these sort of phytochemicals that um, they talk about in the Dorito effect and, and things were sort of classically seen as toxins. But now, as we still, we come to, because they have got quite some low LD50s, they, so some of these compounds are quite bad for you. But at the same time, we recognize that foods rich in these things seem to be healthful. So it's a, it's a difficult place to try and to argue. I mean, no, nobody's really arguing against eating vegetables. I'm certainly not. But at the same time, when you start to extract these molecules from food, do they change their character particularly? Um, we don't know what an awful lot of molecules in food do to us. It's just really complicated. We're good at finding big toxins, but finding small toxins, what level of proof are you going to be satisfied with? Um, I, I'm, I'm not trying to put anyone down here. It's, it's just a, it's a difficult place to, 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 try, to try and argue. And where do you want to spend your money and resources finding what's safe and what's not safe? Is it worth killing two dozen mice for this, 50 mice for that? Uh, and if you did, are you still, are, would you then be convinced it's safe? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm again not sort of saying you're wrong. I'm just saying this is it's a difficult space to try and argue. Um, and we could label more flavors, but if you started to label like every molecule you add to food, it would be a very very long list. And maybe it's a worthwhile thing to do. I'm not. I'm again not arguing it. But is that the best way of using the label space in terms of helping people make healthy food choices? Um, I'm sorry if I come across a negative. Website. There's always a website. <laughs> So, oh, it's very possible to, um, if you want to spend the money, to buy very good peaches and very good nectarines in the United States. Uh, it's very good. It's just that it costs more money. The whole setup of our, our, our food system, our kind of industrial food system, is to make food that costs the least. And then if you have people interfering by saying, the well, that food will kill you, or, or that food is not nutritious, then that's a, um, a kind of um, barrier against the low-cost food system um, becoming almost poisonous, if it isn't poisonous now. The idea that a food loft is a good idea because it's big, that's very sick. 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 There's, there's lots of land out there. I mean, don't come on. It's just, it's, it, also, most food lots do not produce the top quality of beef. Um, 
that generally comes from smallish farms and um, costs a lot more than the beef you buy in the the uh, supermarket. I mean, a a large steak of of, of kind of a prime, well marbled beef that's been aged for forty days. So yeah, but uh, you know that'll cost sixty, seventy, eighty dollars. Uh, so it's not a matter of that we don't have the you know good food or um, that capitalism is is bad for food. I mean we're not we're not going to repeal capitalism in probably maybe our uh, our lifetimes. Um, but, but even if that would be a good idea. The um, there's a grower in California of uh, uh, tree fruit uh, by uh, John Mariani. Now he has a farm or, or an orchard, whatever you call it, that has a lot of trees, and um, twice a summer. Well, he used to have tastings, and I went to one last year. There were maybe two, um, 70 different kinds of nectarines right from his own trees. They didn't even taste like each other. They were, they were unbelievable. Um, you can't really talk about this unless you've tasted 70 different kinds of nectarines to know whether it's a molecule here or a molecule there. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that's a reductio ad uh, uh, absurdum that, that is absurd in itself. The, um, um, just because we can't be perfect in distinguishing between two nectarines to scientifically, no one who had tasted them would disagree. And so we shouldn't throw out the idea that we can distinguish between um, better and, and less good. I would be surprised, um, even if you round it up, a whole bunch of American consumers from the middle of the country and you fed them some of these nectarines. Now that you wouldn't realize that it's probably part of human genetics. But uh, maybe we're losing them to know what a good nectarine tastes like. And um, so now in the United States, we spend, or at least the last time I looked at the numbers, which was really five years ago, so I can't tell you that they're up to date. We spend a lower percentage than any other country on on food. I mean, I pay a lower percentage of the national income uh, or GDP. Um, right after us is Canada, and maybe that's the same as the United States. Um, very shortly under that is England. Yeah, England has very good food now. But 10 or 15 years ago, I mean, it was, it was like poison. It was aesthetic poison. And, um, <laughs> well, I mean, the ice cream was made with, the ice cream, as I discovered when I called a um, factory, because I wondered why the label said, talking in terms of animal fats, is kind of one of the ingredients. So I called the factory and I asked them, what do you mean by animal fats? Is it all butter and stuff? They said, oh no, we don't use butter, it's too expensive. Um, it's, then someone said, is it lard? Do you put lard, pig's lard in your uh, ice cream? He said, yes, we do. Tor suet. Sir, sir, I'm sorry, we, we have to, to get to a closing because there is a second part downstairs. I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you, we want to do a, a closing statement and then we can continue the conversations downstairs. Thank you.
go to the closing statement, I highly doubt they put lard in the ice cream. I could taste that. But I don't know. You're English. Do they put lard in ice cream there? And then go on to your closing statements. We'll start with you tomorrow because you have uh, the working microphone. Are you going to answer the lard question? Yeah. Um, I don't think they put lard in. They put vegetable fat in. Yeah. You're only allowed to make it with dairy fat in the U.S., and I, I'm going to defend the food of my country, uh, but, <laughs> but I'm not going to defend British ice cream. Yours is much better. <laughs> I haven't prepared a closing statement, um, but I do like the idea of hearing food technologists talk, and I very much liked talking to all of you. Um, and so to be sort of useless and digressive, there's another great farm called Frog Hollow that sells um, dried a bajillion, there's the bajillion again, a bajillion different varieties of stone fruits that you can order online. And so if you want to taste a truly amazing and really exorbitant um, nectarine of many varietals in the middle of winter, froghollow.com. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of came to this event wondering what we were going to end up arguing about. And I wonder, really, did we end up arguing about anything at all? Um, I think there's things we value in food, which are material things and which are non-material things. I think making um, the material delivery of food work as well as we possibly can, recognizing it's got faults, is going to give us space to explore the less material virtues, and that's a good thing, too. I, wouldn't like to come across as this blind defender of the industrial food system, but I think we'd, um, if we can start to focus on the things we're worried about, like the fact that the people who are hungry in this city, like the fact that there are dairy farmers in the state who can't make a living, and so on and so forth, like, um, we might be ha engaged in a in a. Well, that's what we're, we're really worried about. We're not worried about food processing as much as I think we are. Yes, um, I think I agree about that. Um, as a sort of nerd, I love knowing about stones in the uh, flow-through system of uh, flour mills. Um, there, but I can appreciate that maybe not everybody is keen on that. Um, so I think it does come back really uh, to a question of politics. The question I've been asking myself recently is there are so many issues now in play ar around food that have been for the last 10 years that nobody can be an expert on all of them. So I think one of the questions we have to ask um, as a society and as a group is how do we set up systems of uh, control of testing of trust so that you know you don't have to worry every time because I don't want to spend all my time doing that and I don't think you do either. I haven't prepared anything either but I'm going to pivot a little bit off of what you said Rachel which is also um, coming from my experience I'm not trained in the way that some people are but I would argue that there is no um, silver bullet to solve these problems, this debate between is technology good, is technology bad with respect to our food system. But I would urge people here to just think about balance, to think about making change at a molecular level. The gentleman who stood up and talked about these companies doing interventions, that change happens in really sometimes obvious places and change sometimes happens in discrete places. So I think it's just important to pay attention that it's a system and that the system is connected and we are part of that system. And thanks to MoFAD for organizing this. Oh. Yeah. Well, thanks guys for coming. That concludes the, uh, this portion. However, there is a reception, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a reception downstairs, guys, uh, on the first floor, kind of on your way out. Um, there's going to be food and drink there, so I hope you'll join. Um, there are also gift bags uh, generously put together by Cullinest and 150ish, so please make sure to grab one on your way out. And also, please don't forget to hand in your survey and fill it out if you haven't already. Thank you. Thank you.